Well, good morning. Ooh, sorry about that. Good morning. <laughs> My name is Isaac Choles. I'm an elder here at All Saints. It is a joy of mine to be here to worship with you this morning. Welcome for those of you who are gathered here and also joining us online. Um, it is a pleasure truly to be here embodied worshiping uh, with one another, and we do miss you. Uh, we are praying for those who are, are at home worshiping with us. Well, first of all, I just wanted to thank all of the volunteers who helped put together yesterday evening's fantastic Christmas performance. The kids of All Saints did a great job, and it was a tremendous blessing to me, and I hope also for you, those who were able to attend. But just a, a big thank you to the volunteers that were able to help with that. Thank you. At the back of your bulletin are a few items to keep you notified on what is happening here at the church. If you are interested in becoming a member here at All Saints or are new to the community, I would encourage you to send an email to any of the elders. Our details are actually listed there at the back of the bulletin, but in particular, contact Phil Hunter. We would love to be able to uh, enter into a conversation with you and your family and, and get to know you better. Well, this morning during Advent season, we're inviting our younger members at All Saints to prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. <clears throat> and this morning, Elliot and Madeline Ramsey will be leading us in a reading on love. So would you guys please come on up? On this third Sunday of Advent, as we think about the coming of Jesus Christ, we light the candle of love. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us. This is how God showed his love. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. As a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. All the men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Would you please stand with me as we have our call to worship from Isaiah chapter 12. Join with me. God is our salvation. We trust in him and are not afraid. The Lord is our song and our strength. Him alone do we worship. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. We sing to the Lord for he has done marvelous things. Let us worship God. Let us shout aloud and sing for joy, for, his, for, for great is his Holy One who has come into our time and space.
Please be seated. Would you pray with me? Lord, you love us perfectly. Guide us to love you more fully through the power, power of your Spirit in us. Thank you that in the truest sense of the word, that we know love by knowing how you first loved us and how you within the Trinity from, from everlasting to everlasting have showed perfect love in the Godhead. Lord, as we desire to be a people here at All Saints of hospitality and grace, we ask that during this season culminating in the remembering of the birth of Christ our Lord, that we would be afforded opportunity to share the overflowing love and grace that you show to us as your people. We ask that even amidst busy schedules and uncertain times and difficult trials, help us to remain faithful in our devoted quiet times to hear your voice, to read scripture, and to be filled with prayer for our families, our neighbors, and places that you have, put, that you have placed us in, Lord. It is in the loving name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Well, in preparing our hearts to confess this week to our holy God, it is apt to return, actually, to the quote on the front of your bulletin. Bonhoeffer, who is a hero in the Christian faith, a man who in his day during World War II stood through all kinds of trials. The, this reminds us of our heart positioned even now in our day to stand the trials both external to us and also internal to us in our own hearts each moment. And during the season of Christmas tide, it is very easy to get carried away in trying to ensure that all of the things go off perfectly without a hitch. Gifts have nice tidy bows. Each item gifted is as thoughtful as the next. The lights are up and the tree is up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But let us pause and look at this question together. He asks, who among us will celebrate Christmas right? As we contemplate the ways in which we need reconciled to our God and to our fellow man after this week, know that Jesus came for you. He came for me and for those who are called to his glorious family. There are many ways that we can do things wrong, but cast your gaze on Jesus, your Redeemer, and know that his love for you surpasses all understanding. So let us confess together and then privately now. And if able, please kneel and we will have a time of confession. Read with me. Almighty God, give us grace to cast away the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Now in the time of this mortal life in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to visit us in great humility, that in the last day when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge both the living and the dead, we may rise to the life immortal through him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Father in heaven, as we lift our confessions to you of the ways and the things that we ought to have done or ought not have done, I pray that you would bind those, Lord, and lift them, for you say that, that your yoke is light and your burden is light. Lord, give us the freedom to celebrate you, Jesus Christ, who is given to us. 
Father, we thank you so much that you hear our prayers and that you, you hear our petitions and that you desire for us to live lives freed from the tyranny of the evil one, but to love our neighbors, the estranged, and those who you have called into our life to show and demonstrate the light of the gospel. Be with us, Lord, be with our hearts, and help us, Jesus, to cast our burdens to you, to the cross. It is in your name, Christ, we pray. Amen. Receive this assurance of pardon from Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works.
Please be seated. Well, as Christ models the offering of His life, we are reminded by Him of the incredible riches that are ours in Christ. And it is now in this time during our worship service that we will collect our offering. There's a couple of ways to do that. A box in the back, you can text GIVE to the number listed in your bulletin or also online. Kids, please come up. <laughs> How could I forget? Good morning and Merry Christmas. Uh, my name is Jeff Moore. I worship here with my wife Catherine and our three kids. And so if you would please join me uh, for our prayers for the church and for the world. So. Father in heaven, we so greatly need your power and your strength. We ask that you would fill us with your spirit of love and unity among believers all around the world. 
We ask for your help to set aside our differences and to look to the greater cause, the cause of Christ. Please help us to truly live out a life of love. We know that this is only possible through the power of your Spirit, so we ask that you would move across our community and our land in miraculous ways, with fresh filling and awareness, turning your people back to you, and drawing others to come to know you. We need your unity and your love to stir our hearts and give direction to our days. We need your wisdom to guide us. We need your spirit to lead us to live out godly lives that would bring honor first to you. We thank you that you are always with us and give us great purpose and hope. Today we ask that you would restore Milt and Ann Umphrey to full health. Also continue to comfort and encourage Rob and Kathy Shaner as they await Rob's liver transplant. For others in our congregation suffering physically and mentally, we ask for your healing touch. We pray for our next senior pastor that he may be a man after your own heart and the type of shepherd leader that will help all saints to glorify you and to magnify the gospel of hope in our community. Help us to be willing instruments in your caring hands. We give you thanks today and always for the best gift we could ever receive, your Son and our Redeemer, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much, Jeff. Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see you. My name is Shelton Woods. I'm uh, part of the community here at All Saints, and uh, along with um, Warren Bean and Joe Gerber, Isaac Chules, and Kevin here, part of the search committee for our pastor. And we'd like to give you an update. This actually might be our last update that we will give you on the search committee. It actually started about last uh, June and July when we met with John Purcell from Perimeter Church in Atlanta, who came and met with us to, um, to flesh out uh, our mission and values and, and, and put together uh, what we're looking for in a, in a pastor. In September, we started receiving applications. We received scores of applications, and uh, we narrowed it down to six people. We interviewed those six people, and uh, from the six, we uh, narrowed it down to two who we invited to uh, to Boise, and they were here this past week along with their wives. Uh, and uh, we spent a great deal of time with them. Uh, the search committee and the wives of the search committee, we had dinner with, with them. We met uh, one-on-one, -on -one. Each, each member of the search committee met one-on-one -on -one with these two candidates. Uh, the wives met with the wife of the candidates uh, for tea and, and um, have to thanks uh, Janice Gerber and Isaac Schulz for opening their homes uh, for this. Um, the candidates met with the session members. They also uh, had meetings with uh, the teaching elders here at All Saints, uh, Phil and uh, Mike Kelly and Brad Cheney, our former pastor, to have conversations with them. Um, God has graciously, in his mercy, brought two excellent candidates our way. This week, we will be checking references, and then we will be asking one candidate to come and, uh, and speak for us. Hopefully, if it works out, uh, the Sunday of January 9th is when they will be here to preach for us, and the following Sunday, we will have a vote on the congregation. When he comes, he'll be meeting with uh, the deacons, he'll be meeting with Susie and other ministry leaders, and there'll be an open forum so that you can speak with that candidate. We hope that the candidate will be here and uh, will move to Boise in March. We are so thankful that we're going to have Mike Kelly through, through May, our interim pastor, and so give them a couple of months to, to get used to this area. So, um, so you'll know in a, in a week or two, maybe, who, who the candidate will be. And uh, we thank you so much for your prayers and, and all the work. I thank my colleagues on the search committee and their wives for all the work. So. Please continue to be in prayer. God has given us great peace, and because of that, we're able to extend peace to each other. So let's stand and greet each other with the peace of Christ.
Good morning. It's good to be here. That's good news. Uh, I'll give you a little heads up about, about preacher types, though. Is that, uh, that fellow, whoever he is, might not want to listen to me for eight weeks. <laughs> so the farewell party could happen a little sooner than it might be indicated. You'd be like, I could do that better. So, uh, all right. Hey, uh, we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 2 today. See it in your bulletin. You read this chapter and it appears, at, or this passage, it appears at first to be about the death of Christ. But what I want us to understand is that the death of Christ began at his birth, really, in significant ways, because he entered in uh, to a world that was dominated and ended for all of us in death. You know, there's no way to talk about the incarnation without getting theologically technical, and I'm, I'm sure that you have the capacity to understand that, but it's also, because of that, it's easy to, uh, to miss its more existential, perhaps emotive reality. So what I want you to, to write down and take away is, is, is I want you, and I've been praying this week, that you would see and sense how much Christ endured so that he could understand those he saved. I want you to sense and see how much Christ endured by way of suffering so that he could not only save you, but look you in the eyes and say, I understand. I know what it is like to live here. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I ask you in your mercy to please show us what great love Christ gave to us, what sacrifice there was in just his coming here, um, just his embodiment in the womb of Mary, um, and how he loves us still and forever, we pray in Jesus' name. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Amen. You should read about Ernest Shackelford and his epic expedition to the Antarctica. They, I won't spoil it for you, except, you know, Pretty much everybody but one guy lived, so I guess I just did spoil it. 
But here's what I want you to here's what I want you to remember about it today. They brought with them in this effort to walk across the and our, to the pole, they brought with them a tea set. And the reason they did is because English. That's what English people do. They were going to bring this emblem of their civilization into the most extreme circumstances uh, imaginable, circumstances that trapped them for uh, almost two years, as if I remember correctly. Jesus did not bring a tea set. When Jesus came to us, he came into the world the way it is and suffered the curse of death as it was given. And in doing so, he showed us the measure of his love to endure suffering so that he could understand you as he saved you. So we're going to see, I hope, three things this morning. The mandate of his suffering, the measure of his suffering, and the ministry of his suffering. So let's take a look at the mandate of his suffering. We read some important things about the Father's participation in the incarnation of the Son. His divine design, or we might say, his insistence, the orders by which the Son in that glorious eternal covenant with the Father and the Holy Spirit was told to come to us. We read that he was uh, made by the Father's agency. The Father made him a little lower than the angels in verse 7. Something remarkable that the perfect Son of God was made perfect by his suffering. These are all actions that the Father God the Father is said in this passage to bring to the Son. He was also made like his brothers. In all these ways, in all these points of pressure and suffering, in every one of them, the, the Father is prescribing, if you will, to the Son what he must endure, how redemption will be realized for the people of God. Jesus, of course, submits to his Father. That's the whole um, course of his life. I came to do the will of the one who sent me. He says a, a hundred times, I delight to do your will. That's his food. That's his everything, to do what God has called him to do. And we're told, to, after those actions of the Father imposing suffering on the Son, we're told in these very clear terms that it was somehow fitting and he was made like us in every respect. This is what God commanded from the Son. It was fitting. That is, it was suitable. We might even say necessary for that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the archetype or the founder or the captain, if you perhaps, the author of their faith, perfect through suffering. So what was God's intent, and how could the perfect Son of God be made perfect? Well, it's not, a, it's not a perfect in his divine nature. It's really, um, in, in some ways, greater than perfect in his human nature, although his obedience um, to all of God's commands and um, his... Uh, Escape from the original sin of Adam by the virgin birth made him perfect. But, but Christ had a perfection of mission, what, what I'm going to call an existential perfection. If he was going to come to us, the Father mandated that he come and he live the way we live. That he not, if you will, bring the tea set with him. That divine emblem of glory but that he enter into, as we'll see when we look at the measure of his suffering, will, will en he will enter into our world. He had a missional, existential perfection. He, he was not given um, an escape route. He was not given an instrument by which he could um, minimize and eliminate suffering that you and I, not being the 
eternal sons and daughters of God, he doesn't have any of the tools that you and I have, that you and I don't have. He didn't cheat. There's a book um, I started to read called Nickled and Dimed. Um, you need to admit every once in a while that you start to read a book and then don't finish it. That's the, that's the only way to have integrity about your reading, your reading patterns. And it, was, it was a woman, a reporter, who decided to live on minimum wage um, jobs, which was a good exercise to talk about what it's like to do that. But I, I started reading in and I realized that she made a couple decisions. She would never miss a meal and she would never sleep in her car. And I actually think it was an admirable exercise. You could learn empathy and, and understand and share that. But the reason I'm bringing it up is um, Jesus didn't say that when he came to us. The Father wouldn't allow him to say that. That, that if you want to understand the measure of his endurance of suffering so he could understand you, Know then that the Father wanted him to be perfect in this way. In every respect. It's a beautiful little Greek phrase. Just two words, katapas, in every way, both in nature and circumstance. Both by the cross and by his daily life and the reality. You know, another thing, when we were all in lockdown, a couple of very rich, very famous people uh, just got Twitter mobbed when they talked about how they're suffering with the rest of us, you know, in their lockdown. You know, they're like 18,000 square foot home, you know, and, uh, and it's really tough. And, um, you know, it was tough on everybody. There's no doubt about that. But, but that didn't fly in the Twitter sphere. And um, it, it's not what Jesus did for us. He was made like his brothers in every respect. That's not just by the design of the Father. That's not just that he had a body like yours. But he lived in the world as you do. He didn't have special powers to circumvent the frustration and futility and the relational wounds and all the other stuff that happens. He didn't do that. I've got you, uh, if you're in a community group, I've asked you to read Westminster Shorter Catechism. That's our, our confession of faith and our tradition. Question 27, wherein doth, you have to say doth, wherein doth the humiliation of Christ consist? And I love the first part of the answer. The humiliation of Christ consisteth, we're going all King James here, consists in his being born. That's the beginning of it. Think about that. Think about the glory of someone who is humiliated by birth. The condescension. The demotion, as we'll see in a moment. And that's where it began because he entered in according to the purpose of the Father in every respect, physically, his life situation, it was fitting for him to be made perfect through suffering. So what did that suffering look like? It was mandated by his mission and the Father's divine design. What was its measure? Well, I, nor can you, uh, uncover and articulate the measure of the suffering of Christ. But we have some, uh, actually three indications of it here in this passage. One, he, he suffered a broken world, he suffered a broken body, and he suffered a broken covenant. So let's look at the measure. The, this broken world, um, he was made a little lower than the angels. That word actually, to be made a little lower, um, it, it's really quite an honor if you didn't already exist and you're one of us, because that's from Psalm 8. It's talking about humanity being made just a little lower than the angels, which is a big deal. So for you and for me, um, that is uh, an honor. But in the context of the incarnation, that's a demotion. Jesus, and the language is... Uh, uh, 
that's, that's used uh, speaks, sometimes used exactly for that kind of concept. That Jesus was asked to enter into a, a broken world below and beneath his station. There's another part of the Bible that says he was rich, and, and what did he do? You know the answer. You can actually pretend for a moment that this is a Pentecostal church. He was rich, and what did he do? Yeah, you're not good Pentecostals. It was like, he became poor. So we'll work on that. But he entered right in. What, what we're being told... What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. In respect to Christ, that's not an exaltation, but a humiliation and brought him right into the world, as we can see, um, putting everything in subjection to him. And he left nothing outside his control. But at the present, we do not see everything subjected to him. And neither really did he who was hungry and who was thirsty. Think of the Last Supper, the culminating moment of Christ's ministry, the great feast of his life on earth. He was in a room with a bunch of people who had no idea what was about to happen despite three years of instruction, who argued over who was the greatest, who would run to the four corners of the earth when he was arrested, one of whom was going to betray him and the other one was going to deny him. He entered into the world a little lower than the angel, just exactly as the world is. He suffered a broken world in broken places. Community fracturing, loneliness, futility, all these things. Listen to Psalm 90. For a thousand years in your sight... Or as but yesterday when it passed, as a watch in the night, you sweep them away with the flood, and then like a dream like grass that is renewed in the morning, it flourishes and is renewed in the evening, it fades away. Jesus endured a fallen world just like you do. Jesus built things, taught things, said things that fell apart and didn't work well. His brothers said he was crazy. They mocked him and John. Jesus lived in the world the way that it truly and really is. You know, I was glad to see that the FAA said, hey, you know what? We are not going to give people astronaut wings for going up right to the edge and floating for three minutes. It's like, good. But I did cancel my trip with Jeff Bezos. <laughs> it's going to save $25 million. What I'm trying to communicate to you is that that's not how Jesus, Jesus didn't do um, divine tourism into the world. He came the way it really was. He lost, uh, uh, almost surely lost his, his uh, father on earth, Joseph. He lost his friends. He lost his family. I got to believe he lost carpentry bids at one time or another. I'd like to be the guy that told Jesus, no, I got a better offer. <laughs> but I don't want to make light of the futility of the world that, that we live in and the fact that Christ chose to live in a world that was broken without fixing it at every turn. which may shed light on why he doesn't fix your world at every turn. He didn't fix his own world at every turn. It's not his way. It was not his way. He suffered this broken world exactly like it is. And he suffered, of course, a broken body, which is what we're um, probably more familiar with in the task of his suffering. Uh, we understand that, um, that he came to die. I'm, I'm hoping we understand that his death, in a way like our death, began the moment he was born. He bought into that world of death. The moment he was born and he lived and suffered through it, 
long before Holy Week, long before that Friday. But then when that Friday came, he did suffer this broken body. He had hints of it, just like we do. He was hungry and he was thirsty and he was tired. You know, he had this weakness inherent in him that he didn't, he didn't escape with his divine powers. But then on Friday, some eternally significant things happen, one of which we're most familiar with, the other, which, the other of which we have some hints in this passage when we're told that he suffered and tasted death. And then we're told he was, the theological word that's used here is propitiation. We're told that he was um, crucified for our sins. It was a punitive death as a substitute for us. So let's look at, at those two realities. I want to look at the second first because it's the one we're most familiar with. And then I want to emphasize the second by way of what we're trying to learn today about him. If you're exploring Christianity, um, I'm so thankful that you're here. At the very core, the very center of the message is this great story that God sent his son to live a perfect life and then absorb his wrath for those of us who couldn't live a perfect life, which is everyone. Another place in the Bible says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is called the substitutionary atonement. It's at the heart of, the, of where forgiveness comes from. And it was excruciatingly painful for Jesus. And it was both physically and spiritually. The Passion of the Christ, that, that famous movie from 20 years ago, I got a lot of grief for being so graphic about the crucifixion of Jesus on film. Um, you can decide whether or not that should be on film, but just understand that it was historically pretty accurate is what happened to him. He knows what physical pain is, and physical pain is part of the enduring reality of a fallen world. But also, when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was that divine moment, we think, when, when God turned from him and that eternal fellowship was broken in the moment of judgment for our sins. Jesus, I would say this, it's good to remember, Jesus has suffered more than you have. And more than I have, because he suffered more than anyone has. Amazingly, that does not make him... <laughs> That doesn't make him look down on your suffering. It makes him empathetic with it because, after all, he's perfect in love. But he, the church was hard on Jesus. But what I want us to see is something else. It's more about his pathos, about his suffering. The fact that we're told that he tasted death. That's a, that's a, a very personal very uh, tactile expression of the reality of what Christ experienced. And it's important for us to grasp the measure of his death. His death was not um, a one-dimensional expression of his divine obedience. It was a death like your death and my death. He absorbed death. He tasted death. He smelled it. Filled his mouth with it. It was personal for him. Jesus is not a savior bot. He was a human person who tasted what you taste and experienced what you experience. That broken body was broken for a covenant, the propitiation of, his, of our sins. But it was very, very personal. I told you once before about a near-death experience I had. Not like died and saw a light, but like nearly died. And then um, I want to tell, tell you one more because uh, I've been thinking of it as I... Uh, meditate on this idea of experiencing death. The closest I've actually come to experiencing death was in an emergency room. 
um, when I had terrible chest pains and like a dummy, I, I insisted on not calling an ambulance and had my wife panicking, driving me to the hospital because she married an oaf, you know, and we get to the hospital and this is what you don't want. When, when you walk in the hospital, you don't want somebody to yell something and the doors to fly open and like five people to come get you. But that's just like, so I love waiting in ERs now because I know what it means. It means you're okay. Okay, so they fly me in there, and I am like, it, I'm in a tremendous amount of anguish and pain. And uh, this would be a little dramatic. I don't mean to, to overshare, but I, I look across. My wife is, you know, six feet from me, and I look at her, and the tunnel starts to close on her face. And and I reached out to her, and it got very small right around her face, and I thought I am dying they put some medicine in me and right when it got to her face within like five seconds it opened up and I was a hundred percent fine I wasn't having a heart attack the doctor said I think you were having esophageal spasms which is super uncool for all that drama <laughs> like I'm like can we get a cooler diagnosis because this was pretty extreme, and I wanted, I don't want to tell people I had esophageal spasms. <laughs> and he said, well, maybe you didn't. I don't know. I, you know, then he did one of those fancy paragraphs that mean I'm a doctor and I'm just guessing, but I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> Sorry, Phil. <laughs> so, uh, um, but, but. Kidding aside, I want us to understand that the death of Christ wasn't technical. He had that experience and the light closed on him. It was a real death. And he did it for you. Not, not just a judicial death, which it was. Not just a covenantal death, which is how we suffered for us a broken covenant, as well as a broken body. But it was a personal death of, a, of an individual who was every bit as alive and actually even more than you and I are. Whose life actually ended. He experienced the closing of that circle as he looked out, if he had anything left in him to look out anymore. at his mother and John and his people and this random centurion. And he did this so that when you die, you might be assured that he knows what that moment is like, not just as a Savior, but as a human being who tasted death and rose again of course for us that he might have a ministry to suffers not just the mandate that he fulfilled or the measure of its endurance but now what does he do for us in his suffering now that it is over well um, what we learn, first of all, in this passage is that he came to suffer so he could fix the world. Well, does the world seem fixed to you? Not lately. No. We, we live with enough wealth that we can kind of fake a fixed world most of the time, unless there's a pandemic. You know, we're still doing COVID in Seattle, by the way. You should know that. So it's, a, it's creepy when I leave there and come here and I'm like, we're just different worlds, but I don't want to go there. Uh, he fixed the world. That's what this language is when, when we read in our passage that um, he put everything in subjection to him. He left nothing outside of his control. And that's what we know about the exaltation of Christ now. But then he goes on to say, yeah, but we don't see that now. And, 
And what I want us to understand about the ministry of his suffering is that the ministry of his suffering, as we'll see in this passage, did conquer the problem of the world. It absolutely did. Death no longer has a sting. We have, as it were, in Christ, we have um, antibodies for the curse of the world. But we're called to see that curse lifted now by faith. We can't see it, but we can see it because we have seen the suffering Son exalted to the right hand of the Father, ruling over all things for the sake of His church. And that's what you and I will get in this life, in this age, until He comes back again. We will get this message that someone endured suffering so perfectly with such love and obedience and humility that suffering no longer wins and death no longer has victory. His ministry of suffering, well, it fixed the world because it satisfied the reality of the curse. And with that, then he embraces sufferers. I love this phrase, he's not ashamed to call them brothers. Who are you ashamed to be seen with? I know there's someone. Oh, I'll make it more personal. Why in the world would Christ be ashamed to be seen with you? Well, of course not. I'm actually kind of cool. Well, consider who he is and where he is from and where he was eternally and how he's exalted now. Consider how foolish you and I are, how deeply stained our heart is, how dense our mind is relative to his, how we still love sin, how hard it is to concentrate even in worship. Well, he's like, yeah, you're mine. These are my people. These foolish, uncool, broken, distracted, frustrating, petty, bitter, lovely people. Father, I'm right here. I'm at all saints. It's it's as if Jesus says, I will even go to worship at all saints. And if we don't understand how amazing it is that he is here with us dwelling in our midst, even in our own hearts right now. Like he is into you. He is not embarrassed about you. Or me. I tell you, every time I read this passage, I think of my first day in seventh grade. Seventh grade started a season of really brutal struggling for me that that brought me into a lot of bad places over the next seven years. Ten years. And probably no greater emblem of it than when one of my grade school friends, because we did sixth grade was grade school where I went, Keith came up and I was trying to talk to these people who were obviously even, you could tell like on the first day, the cool kids from another school. And Keith came up to him, so ashamed of this. Keith came up and just like me, just like scared to death in seventh grade. And he stood right next to me. And one of these girls looked at him and then looked at me. And she said, "Um, you're not friends with him, are you? And I looked at her and said, no. It's almost 50 years ago. And my heart sinks with shame every time I think, that, think of that story. And I think of that story every time I read this passage. And I've had to read this passage 50 times this week. And Jesus will never say that about you. Not one of yours, are they? Oh, yes, they are. Oh, yes, they are. I suffered so I could understand I died so they could be. And then he teaches them. His ministry of suffering, he teaches us. He has this credibility. Um, 
He has a credibility. We know how he lived. We know what he suffered. And he says, I'll declare your name right in the middle of the assembly. And if we understand how he suffered, we'll know, we'll know that he is qualified to teach us, not because he, only because he knows everything we need to know, but because he's experienced everything we need to experience. And he will declare his brothers, his uh, excuse me, his, his father's name in the presence of his brothers. And then he says something really remarkable. I will put my trust in him. So uh, this is really what's going on. You have to kind of dig into the word a little bit. But, but the, the image that I want to draw out of this and show to you is that Jesus is in the midst of us saying, I'm declaring the name of God. I'm telling you who God is. I'm telling you what he's like. I'm telling you what he wants. And you can trust me because I, I've lived here where you live. And I know what it's like to be in your hood. And then it's really about confidence. He's saying, I trust him. Your sympathetic Savior who lived in a broken world with a broken body and endured a broken covenant, he's saying, to you, I'm confident in my Father. I trust Him. He's leading us into trusting God for all of the brokenness. And of course, His suffering frees us. There's so much here. I don't know if I'm going long or not, but, uh, but this great language of those who were held captive to the fear of death you know, you have to go far and wide till you uh, find somebody who's like really afraid to actually die. Like that's not a thing I don't know about here, but like in Seattle, no one's afraid to go back into the earth and, and become some other expression of life, even if they're not conscious about it. That's just not a thing my neighbors are struggling with. Okay, but, but let me ask you this. Ha, ha, do you know anyone who's afraid of suffering? Because that's the parallel in this passage. Suffering uh, eradicates meaning. It causes pain. Yeah, there's a lot of people that are afraid of death. The shadow of death. Let me ask, have you ever lied? It's because you didn't want to die. Have you ever bought something on credit that you know you couldn't afford? It's because you were afraid of the small micro nano death that not having what you desired would mean to you. Have you ever exploded in anger? No one here has done that. Because you felt small and threatened and would not suffer. Lust is the same. If you withdraw from others because you're afraid of being wounded, those are all signs. Jesus came to free us from that by showing us that he suffered and conquered death. He beat it up. That's seriously tough. We should think of him in this way. No one has ever been so tough that they could die and still win. Jesus did that for you. And now, what does he do with all that? Was well, merciful and faithful and helpful. This is the, the most uh, remarkable part of his exalted glory in this passage is that after enduring the foolishness of his disciples and his people for lo, these thousands of years, after entering into the world, he didn't break to fix it. He's just kind and steadfast and helpful. So think about you and your and your circumstance right now. Think about all the reasons why, if he was any different, Jesus would just give up on you. I give Jesus reasons to give up on me every single day. But you know what? He's merciful. And he's faithful. And he's helpful. It's who he is. He's more merciful and more faithful and more helpful 
then I am stupid or distracted or selfish or foolish. That's his ministry. So one more last thing I want to assure you, comfort you of, and unless one comes in the next 30 seconds, I don't really have a conclusion to this message despite looking for one all week. So we're just going to stop. But, but here is what I want you to be comforted by. You are suffering somehow. Or you will or you did. But you probably will again. Unless, yeah, you will. I want you to be emboldened in your suffering. Remembering two things. One, when Jesus did not escape suffering himself. And 30 Three years before Good Friday, Jesus suffered by the very act of coming. Jesus knows. He knows. He's merciful, faithful, and helpful. He didn't take away his suffering. For the same reason, much of which is a mystery, that he's not going to take away yours when you want him to. But he will do this. He'll stand right with you in it and say, trust the Father in your suffering the way that I myself did in my own. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I uh, ask you please, Lord Jesus, to um, comfort us with these words. Let us understand how much you endured so that you could understand us even as you save us. Lord Jesus, let us know the measure of your love. We pray in your good name. Amen. Please stand. Let's begin to prepare our hearts as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. Participate in the fruit of his um, love and suffering for us. Amen.
Please be seated. Well, the downside of having someone like Mike preach is that it sets the bar pretty high. <laughs> One of the candidates, this, one of the candidates that we were interviewing this week, we asked him what he thought about All Saints, and he said, "You know, I've been watching their worship services, and that preacher is really good." And I, <laughs> I said, "Buddy, you're going to have to raise your game a little bit." But thank you, Mike. That was an awesome, awesome sermon. Um, as Mike was, well, let me begin by saying this is uh, the time that we come to celebrate every week communion, uh, the Eucharist, uh, which is uh, Greek for Thanksgiving, which we. Give thanks for our Lord and Savior who gave his life for us, a time to remember and a time to be nourished spiritually. This is a family meal for baptized believers, so if you're a baptized believer in the community of the Christian church, uh, this, is a, this is a meal for you. Um, as Mike was uh, talking about the suffering and humiliation of Jesus, I thought a little bit about something uh, that happened uh, last evening. I, was, I don't know how in the world I found it, but uh, there's a pastor who I love very much, and a good friend of mine in, uh, in Southern Oregon where we lived in Medford for a long time, and he actually introduced us to uh, Reformed theology, for which I'm eternal grateful, eternally grateful. And uh, I, found, I was looking for one of his sermons, and I, I didn't find any. And there was another pastor that had taken his place or a couple, a couple of pastors. So I thought, well, I wonder what happened to Dale. And I did a Google search and uh, found his Facebook page. And uh, it turns out that he developed ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, about two years ago. And he's had just a steady, progressive wasting of his muscles over two years. And now, and he was in a video talking about <clears throat> really kind of giving hope to people who are suffering terminal illness and He's in the last, the last couple of lengths of the golf course of life himself. He's in a wheelchair, can't speak too well, and most of his muscles are, are wasted away, such as the course with that illness. But he said something. Um, it was encouraging, it was sad, but he said, you know, I spent 30 years of my life trying to prepare people how to swim when the boat goes down. And it's a phrase that kind of stuck with me, and I think that for all of us, um, the boat eventually goes down. You know, it's sooner or later we all face death. We all face suffering, uh, even as our Lord did. And as he said, example for us, how to face life and how to face death because he lived the life that we should have lived and died the death that we all deserve. Um, and uh, in, the, in that light, along that, along that line I read yesterday from Isaiah, this passage. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. And indeed, God did accomplish all of his purpose in sending his son to die the death that we deserved so that we can enjoy life eternal with him. And that's why this isn't a sad time to celebrate. This is a time of celebration, not a funer funereal or funeral meal. This is a time we celebrate and give thanks for what Jesus did for us. The Lord be with you. With Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Please bow your heads. Father, we bow before you during this time of reflection. Help us to examine our faith as we come before you. We eat this bread and drink this cup as you instruct us in the Bible. Thank you, because the price that Jesus paid allows us to participate in communion. Your love for us was expressed without question as you gave your Son for us. Strengthen and cleanse us now, we pray. In your name, amen. We read in Scripture that on the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus 
took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for many for the remission of sins. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you celebrate and proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Drink ye all of it. Amen. Please stand. I want to say a special thank you to Tina Watts and her right-hand man, Carl, for the beautiful display. I, I was sitting over there, and I was watching Mike preach and, and watching this, and I got a sense of this transcendent beauty, which is kind of hard to get in a gymnasium, but somehow <laughs> Tina, Tina pulls it off. So thank you so, so very much. Woo Now receive this benediction from the Lord. May the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. Amen.